who takes the credit. Uh, thank you, David Durrell. Uh, I've decided that these conferences are important, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to say a word about what they're about, and then I'm going to introduce PJ. A uh, long time ago, seven years ago maybe, David came to me and he had this idea, and uh, I've told this before, but I'll tell it again. I said, I don't understand. I said, do you want to teach uh, freedom to the Christians, or do you want to teach Christianity to the heathen? <laughs> and he said, we want to teach freedom to the Christians. And I said, good, let's do that. So that's why you're here. Um, I th <laughs> Uh, I think our partners in this, Acton and other great people, I know a lot of you and I'm so glad you're here and I'm proud to work with you. We are talking about free markets and freedom and Christianity and that's two of the three things that are in peril today and two of the three things that give us our uh, lives, allow us to live as human beings. The third is implied by the two. Christianity is a very curious religion about politics and law. It's uh, unique, in fact. You can see the pattern, the old pattern, the regular pattern in Judaism. God gives the law. It covers lots of things that today we think of as civic, private. The test is to obey the law. It's not everybody's law, it's the chosen people's law. But it's like the ancient city in this regard. The substance of the relations is in the law. Will you keep the law or will you not? The Jews had the hard duty of trying to keep it and failing. Of course, they were constantly punished and sometimes rewarded. It's a legal religion. Athens and Sparta were like that. If you want to see something in modern times like that, look at one of these Islamic republics. Obedience is the test. There are laws and they govern everything. Jesus was this incredibly frustrating guy because uh, he never did get going and get his army up and uh, get his courts running and set up his regime. There's some evidence in the New Testament that he was crucified because of disappointment about that. He was not the kind of Messiah that was expected. My kingdom is not of this world. People who built our country drew a deduction from that more clearly than anyone ever had before. Their deduction was, yeah, gonna have to have government. There are some things that should leave, leave alone. It's complicated because we're gonna have wars and we're gonna have good comportment to each other. The law is still gonna be a very commanding thing, but it's gonna be conceived as a protection of some things that each of us is responsible to do and has a right to do. The regime of civil and religious liberty was was invented in its full form here in this country. In that point of view, religion is a source of privacy, something our own, each accountable to his maker, each free and fully human to work out that. They speak of the bonding of civil and religious freedom in the making of the country. Property rights is a civil freedom like relations with God, it's written in the nature of the human being. We're necessitous beings. We're born with a brain and a hand, and a pair of hands, and we have to feed ourselves. Everybody has that problem. It goes on every day, all the time, it's incessant. And so the idea was that uh, as we go about that, these are our own needs. We should be protected in the property that we gather. Don't mistake, we're the most social of all beings, say the classics, because we can talk. We have a connection with each other that's different than any other kind of being. 
in my family, they, they, uh, we have dogs, and we watch them all the time. They're our example. Well, we have cats, too, but I never pay attention to them. <laughs> and um, th does anybody want a cat? But uh, the dogs, you know, they like to, they, they try to talk to you. One time I said to one of the dumbest boxers we ever had, I said, that, look at that dog, Penny, my wife. I said, uh, he's quivering on the threshold of understanding. <laughs> and she said, uh, doesn't look to me look much like he's going to cross it. <laughs> but we do cross it, you know, and since we have these needs and we satisfy them, we could trade. We could have a form of, of uh, cooperation that's profound. We could have the division of labor. We could cooperate in that really close way that we do whenever we have economic relations. And if we have our property rights, because it's written is the claim in our nature, then we'll get very close and we'll produce a lot and markets will flourish and they can't really be stopped. Because free people who own their own stuff, they'll trade it, and they'll work for each other. A source of privacy, like religion. A source of each person empowered, however he's born, whatever his station, to live a fully human life. I said there were three, and the third is the family. Because if our concern with God and our property rights are written in our nature. That word nature comes from the Latin word for birth, and we have a very unusual way of growing up with human beings. It takes a long time to raise our children. And now we have data, alas, because we lived in such an age where the family is, is collapsing. I mean, it's collapsing fast all around us. Half the babies born out of wedlock. And there's data to say that that's not good. But think what happens in a family. Our speaker tonight is hilarious and eloquent. He's always both, by the way. About family relations. Makes you giggle to think about the things he's written, and partly you giggle because they're so true. Because it's hard to raise kids, you know? And if somebody doesn't do it, they don't do so well. And we can measure that now. Another source of privacy, because every mother and every father basically exercises a dominion that covers much of the same ground that a king would have. What shall I be? How shall I behave? How, how shall I grow up? Every mother and every father answers those questions. It gives them a scene of action in which to be fully a human being. Now, everything that I just said is not controversial. It's rejected by the academic world today. It's repudiated, and increasingly by the political world. In uh, Houston, two weeks ago, the city attorney delivered a subpoena to a bunch of preachers to deliver his sermons to him so that he could investigate them for a breach of a law governing political speech. And freedom of speech, if it means anything whatsoever, it means freedom to talk about politics. And if this city attorney, he was working in a blue city, but if he'd been working in a blue state, then that thing wouldn't have been quashed by the state attorney general. And we'd be reading these sermons today, and he'd be making charges about how these people have broken the law inside their own churches where everyone who goes is a volunteer. In Maryland, it is illegal to deny any person access to a public bathroom of whatever gender they are. And Hillsdale College for 171 years, this is 171st, doesn't have co-ed dorms. And that's an old thing. The idea is we're gonna work so closely together we're going to be colleagues in a college, both those words mean partnership, that we can't be thinking mainly about each other's bodies, especially not in our residence halls. Is it gonna be legal for us to maintain that institution? I fear. 
But I can tell you, because I have some experience with this now, to make a college productive and fun and happy, you actually have to have agreements about things like that. And if that's what you're arguing about, then you're ripping each other up and you're not really thinking together. And I claim for our college that it's not only true that we don't take any money from the government, direct or indirect, I also claim that in 1863, you can look back in the past also when it wasn't taking any money from the government. The things happened on battlefields in Pennsylvania and they might have been different if we hadn't have been there. And we didn't ask anything of anybody to go with, they just went because they loved. Can you see how that's a reversal of fundamental civic institutions? And what's become of our right to property? In Connecticut, they uh, took a bunch of people's homes away. They were living in the homes. They were old homes. A couple of families had been there for a long time. And what they, they took them away, by the way, they never did anything with the land. They just moved them out. But the plan was they were gonna let other people build commercial buildings on it that were subsidized so those other people could make a lot of money and so that the authorities who approved all this could make a lot of money because they wanted the tax rate base up because, you know, it's hard to pay for these pensions these people get. All three of those areas, you see, something close to 50% of the children are being born out of wedlock and we're locked in a great national debate about how many genders there are. <laughs> the answer is an infinite number, as many as there are people. I think these conferences are valuable because uh, I'm looking for friends, and I bet you are too. There's a fight. It's a fight for freedom. And freedom is valuable for the things it protects. Our faith, our property, our families, our ability to live as human beings. Thank you for coming. Uh, so that's enough on these grim subjects. Now it's time to make fun of them. <laughs> so my colleague Kyle and I listened on the uh, way down to Indianapolis today to one of the most important works of political philosophy written in recent times. Its title is, Don't Vote, It Only Encourages the Bastards. <laughs> <laughs> it begins with a high tone. There's a story about a duchess. It concerns flatulence. <laughs> it also concerns most of the stories of this man you're gonna hear are the same, right? In other words, there's some noble and fine thing and it's dressed up in the subject of flatulence. <laughs> and this is about two gentlemen, an American and an Englishman who keep taking responsibility for the outburst. <laughs> and then he proceeds from that to an apology for his barnyard language in this particular book, uncommon though it is in his writings. And uh, apology, you know, means defense and his defense is an argument. He has to be true to his subject matter, politics. <laughs> he was born in 1974 <laughs> he was born in 1974 in Toledo, Ohio. There's a transposition in there somewhere. <laughs> he went to Miami University of Ohio, and uh, that's because Hillsdale College was probably too strict. <laughs> He's uh, smart, and he has contact with fancy education. He is smart, very smart. Um, he's a he, he, he studied at Johns Hopkins, got an MA. And then, God help us, he becomes a war correspondent for the Atlantic Monthly and Rolling Stone. <laughs> Last night I was at a dinner and somebody quoted a recent passage from 
from uh, Rolling Stone, and I looked at him agog. This person is one of the last people, and almost everybody I know is one of the last people I think would be reading Rolling Stone. He said, I read it every, every time, he said. He's written a lot of books. Uh, he's hilarious, but there's more to him than that, I, although, by the way, that's enough. Um, I've known him a long time. I admire him very much. And uh, I figured out a while ago, some years ago now, that underneath all that and above all that both, he's a serious man. Today, I listened to him give one of the clearest and most beautiful explanations I have ever heard of why these principles must lead to the extinction of the human being and the individuality of the human being. It's just very powerful. And it's in between the duchess and the three things you might do to a politician, which I, at least, will not repeat in this company. <laughs> One of the best and wisest men I know, P.J. O'Rourke. Gosh, <laughs> what to say about that? Um, other than that's going to be very hard to live up to. Um, I, I want to talk tonight for a little, a little bit about the political economy of, uh, of the baby boom. And um, the baby boom, you see, is a great boon to economists. Uh, the baby boom allows economists to do the one thing that they like most, the thing they like even more than they like disagreeing with each other. Uh, it, what the baby boom you can do is economists can quantify the baby boom. Baby boom is perhaps the one generation in American history that can be defined with the kind of precise numbers that economists love to have. You can't do that with the greatest generation. Greatest generation, they were defined by the immeasurable forces of the Great Depression and, and World War II. Uh, you can't do this with the millennials. Uh, they are defined by having their noses stuck in personal communication devices. And, uh, 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 and, 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 and no amount of big data can tell us uh, what's up the millennials' noses. <laughs> we just don't know. In fact, most groups of people who get tagged by history as a generation uh, can only be described in an imprecise way. Uh, folks sort of the same age, experiencing sort of the same things in sort of the same place, uh, like the cast of Seinfeld, the cast of Friends, Lost Generation, for instance. Um, I, I am pretty sure, as a result of taking modern literature in college, that Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, James Joyce, Gertrude Stein, Henry Miller, and Ezra Pound were roommates in a big apartment on the left bank in Paris in the 1920s. Um, uh, if I happen to be wrong about that, I, I, I give the sitcom idea free to you members of the audience. Um, the baby boom, however, has an exact demographic definition. We are the children who were born during the period after World War II when the long-term trend in fertility among American women was exceeded. Now, this excess began promptly in 1946 when the boys got home from the war, and it gradually tapered off until in 1964, American women were taking the pill or ro rolling over and pretending to be asleep or telling their husbands, go phone the Pope uh, for birth control advice. Um, by the time the baby boom was done being born, 75,821,000 of us had made our appearance in previously tidy American homes. At the time, the country had a population of 192 million. The baby boom was almost 40% of the population. I mean, no wonder when we sneezed, the nation got the flu. And even now, after all the heart attacks, cancers, car wrecks, suicides, and fatal slips in the bathtub that the actuarial tables demand, we are still a quarter of the citizenry. We're America's largest minority group ever. And the political economic consequences of this minority group have been momentous. 
mainly in the form of minority set-asides like Social Security and Medicare. The youngest baby boomers turned 50 this year. I mean, the last of the baby boomers will be 50 at the end of December. Now, already, about 35% of the federal budget goes to those two minority entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare. By 2030, when the last of the baby boomers is struggling to get the depends on after the Levitra has been taken, um, <laughs> my generation will be getting Social Security and Medicare benefits equal to half of all the money spent in Washington. We're riding down the highway of life in a welfare Cadillac. Now, there's an irony in this, since the single greatest formative factor in the baby boom's existence is that we were the wealthiest generation in geoeconomic history, hands down. Our families had money. Albeit, speaking for myself, and I'm sure most of you, our families didn't have much money. Um, in 1947, when, when I was born, not 1974, uh, 1947, median family income in America was $3,031 a year. Uh, that's uh, $31,700 in 2013 dollars. That's only, uh, uh, that, 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 that 31700 that's only $4,130 more than the 2013 poverty threshold, federal poverty threshold for a family of five. In 1947, to be middle income was a blessing of middling proportions. You know? But it was a huge blessing, a huge blessing nonetheless. The greatest generation, our parents, consecrated itself to raising the country's median income, and they would continue in their devotions. By 1964, median household income had reached nearly $49,700 in 2013 dollars. Just in time to sanctify the baby boom with college education on an absolutely unprecedented scale. Now let, let, let me pause here uh, to note something that, that you, especially you, the economists in the audience already know. Um, the growth of prosperity for middle income Americans oddly hard to measure. Um, in the first place, income per se gives us a poor picture of quality of life. And uh, the CPI does more to obscure than to clarify that picture. In the second place, like many things the government didn't used to be, the government didn't used to be a statistical busybody. The Census Bureau has no, no, no figures for median household income in 1947. Now, UC Berkeley econo uh, 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 economics professor, um, Dr. Emanuel, and I hope I'm saying his, his right name, Saiz. Am I saying, Gary, where are you? Is that how you say his name, Saiz? No, that's how I say it. That's how, you, it's how Gary says it. Okay. I'm going with Gary. <laughs> okay. He spent a lot of time, most, most of the past decade, trying to determine average income in the United States um, o over history. Um, now, uh, 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 of course, ho household income, uh, income is not the same as household income, especially in a two-income household. And an average is a mean, and a mean is not a median. Uh, averages are, are blurry statistics. They're ink smeared by champagne spills at the top and damp seeping into empty refrigerator cartons where homeless people are sleeping at the bottom. Uh, that said, Dr. Dr. Sayers uh, calculates that in the years when the greatest generation was growing up, 2013 to 2000, to, to, I mean 1913 to 1932, average annual income in 2013 dollars ranged between about $12,000 at its lowest and $17,000 at its highest. Now, you compare this to the years when the greatest generation had the baby boom underfoot, 1946-1964, uh, when average income in 2013 dollars ranged between $27,000 and $45,000. It's a big difference. Um, uh, but it's not just the, the quantitative increase that is important, it's also the volatility. From 1946 to 64, average income climbed the social ladder, you know, with only the smallest uh, 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 of slips, you know. Uh, the greatest generation had a very different, very different childhood. From 1913 to 1932, average income went up, it went down, it went way up, it went way down, and the best year and the worst year were only a couple of years apart. The, the economy is a kind of a confidence game. 
And one abiding characteristic of the baby boom has been overwhelming self-confidence. Self-confidence has been way over the top. We can do anything. I give you baby boomer Bill Clinton as an example, or Hillary, for that matter. Um, that's been the baby boom attitude. We, we grew up richer than our parents in a growing and more stable economy. But maybe an even better measurement of what gave the baby boom so much confidence, maybe too much confidence, is to be found in simple GDP figures. Uh, uh, GDP, all the money the people in a country make, divided by all the people. This is a statistic that tells us nothing about our individual economic circumstances, what we eat. But it tells us a lot about our economic atmosphere, what we breathe. Adjusted for inflation, per capita GDP for the years 1913 to 1932, it averages about $8,500 a year. That's the average per capita GDP. Uh, that's the world of the greatest generation. Per capita GDP for the years 1946 to 1964 averages about $18,500. This is the world of the baby boom. Blood is thicker than water, but gravy is thicker than both. The difference between the manners, the mores, the behavior, and the attitudes of the greatest generation of baby boom is $10,000. You can put an exact number on it. And oh my gosh, what that $10,000 bought in the way of change. We, the baby boom, are the generation that changed everything. Of all the eras and epochs of Americans, ours is the one that made the biggest impression on ourselves. <laughs> but that's an important accomplishment because we are the generation that created the self, made the firmament of the self, divided the light of the self from the darkness of the self, and said, let there be self. You know? <laughs> If you were born between 1946 and 1964, you may have noticed this yourself. Before us, self with us out was, was for, without form and void, like our parents in their dumpy clothes and vague ideas. Then we came along. Now the personal is the political, the personal is the socioeconomic, the personal is the religious and the secular, the science and the arts, the personal is everything that creepeth upon the earth after his, and let us hasten to add her, kind, if the baby boom has done one thing, it is to beget a personal universe. And our apologies to anyone who personally happens to be a jerk. <laughs> Self is like a fish, proverbially speaking. Give a man a fish, and you have fed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, and if he turns into a dry fly, catch and release fanatic up to his liver in icy water, pestering trout on three-pound test line on a, a $1,000 graphite rod. Well. At least his life partner is glad to have him out of the house. <laughs> so here we are in the baby boom cosmos, formed in our image, personally tailored to our individual needs, and predetermined to be eternally fresh and novel. And we saw that it was good, or pretty good. You know? We should have had a, a cooler name, you know? like, like, like that lost generation did, you know? except good luck to go to anybody who tries to tell us to get lost. Uh, anyway, it's too late now. Uh, we are stuck with being described as exploding infants, and uh, maybe it is time, now that we have splattered ourselves uh, all over the place, to, for the baby boom to look back and, and think, and think what, what made us who we are, what, what caused us to act the way we do, and as the kids say, WTF. Because <laughs> the truth is, if we hadn't decided to be young forever, we would be old. We'd be sad about getting old if we weren't too busy remarrying younger wives, reviving careers that hit glass ceilings when children arrived, and renewing for prescriptions for drugs that keep us from being sad. Uh, and we'll never retire. We can't. The mortgage is underwater. We're in debt up to the Rogaine for the kids' college education. And it serves, serves us right. It serves us right. We are the generation who insisted that a passion for living should replace working for one. Mm -hmm. Still, it's an appropriate moment for us to weigh what we have wrought and tally what we have added to and subtracted from existence 
We've reached the age of accountability. The world is our fault. Um, we are the generation that has an excuse for everything. Uh, I, to my mind, one of our greatest contributions to modern life. But the world is still our fault, and it's just a matter of power and privilege demography. Whenever anything happens anywhere, somebody over 50 signs the bill for it, you know? And the baby boom, seated at the head of life's table, is hearing Generation X and Generation Y and the millennials all saying, check please. Mm -hmm. But there's a problem with trying to talk about the whole baby boom at once. Um, to address America's baby boom is to face big, broad problems. I mean, we number 75 million, and, and we're not only diverse, uh, we take a thorny pride in our every deviation from the norm, even though we're in therapy for it. Uh, I, we're all alike in that we each think that we are very unusual. Uh, fortunately, we are all alike in our approach to big, broad problems. We won't face them. There's a website for that, a support group to join, a class to take, alternative medicine, regular exercise, a book that explains it all, a celebrity on TV who's been through the same thing, or we can eliminate gluten from our diet. <laughs> History is full of generations that had too many problems. We are the first generation to have too many answers. And that's not a problem. I mean, consider the people who have faced up squarely to the deepest and most perplexing conundrums of existence. I mean, Leo Tolstoy, for example. Tolstoy tackled every one of these conundrums. I mean, why are we here? What kind of life should we lead? The nature of evil, the character of love, the essence of identity, salvation, suffering, death, and what did it get him? Dead, for one thing, and, and, and off his rocker for the last 30 years of his life. Plus, Tolstoy was saddled with a thousand-page novel about war and peace and everything else you can think of, uh, which he couldn't even look up on Wikipedia because he hadn't written it yet, you know? What a life. If Leo Tolstoy had been a baby boomer, he could have entered a, a triathlon, a, a baby boom innovation of the middle 1970s. Um, by the middle 1970s, we knew we couldn't run away from our problems, but if we added cycling and swimming, so, to the talk, uh, uh, to, 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 to the problems of talking about the, the, the baby boom, let us turn our big, broad, yet soon to be firmed up thanks to the triathlon for seniors that we're planning to enter generational backsides. Uh, 46 to 64 is a long time. Uh, distinctions among different kinds of baby boomers need to be made. Geological distinctions are, are geographical, I mean, I'm sorry, geographical distinctions uh, are moot for us, because we moved around too much. Uh, and the distinctions according to race, religion, class, gender, or sexual orientation would be offensive to baby boom sensitivities. But we are the generation that refused to grow up. So I think a reasonable way to sort the baby boom is by, by high school class, as it were, high school class. Now the baby boom seniors, senior class, we were born in the late 1940s. Uh, I'm a senior. Uh, we, 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 we seniors, we were on the bow wave of the baby boom's voyage of exploration. But we were also closely tethered in the wake of the preceding generation, the greatest generation. So in effect, the senior class was keel hauled by the baby boom experience, dragged under the hull, left a bit soggy and shaken. You know? And so if we wound up as, as financial advisors trying to wear tongue studs or as Trotskyites trying to organize Tea Party protests or, or both, uh, uh, we are to be forgiven. Uh, to put it in the simplest terms, Hillary Clinton and Cheech of Cheech and Chong are both members of the baby boom senior class. Now the juniors, the juniors were born in the early and middle 1950s. They, they were often younger siblings of the seniors and they, they came of age when parents were just throwing in the towel. You know, mom and dad were just sick of all the screaming at the dinner table and they just gave up. So the juniors got to pursue the notions, whims, and fancies of the baby boom with an even greater intensity. I mean, for them, drugs were no longer experimental. Drugs were proven, you know. Uh, John Belushi was a junior. Uh, actually, John was born in 1949, but I knew John, and I'm sure he was held back a couple of years. Um, <laughs> the juniors were the teeny boppers, the groupies, the barefoot urchins of Haight-Ashbury, 
Uh, and they did hunt up some shoes when they eventually made their way to Silicon Valley. Bill Gates and, and, and Steve Jobs who were both born in 1955. They never did find their neckties. Um, the sophomores were born in the late 1950s. Now, by the time the sophomores reached adolescence, the baby boom ethos had permeated society. So the sophomore baby boomers had gladly accepted sex, drugs, rock and roll, and the deep philosophical underpinnings thereof. But they had seen enough of the baby boom in action to realize that what works in general doesn't always work when the bong sets fire to the beanbag chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in college, many of the sophomores attended classes. Um, some, some, some even snuck off and got MBAs. Um, now, the freshmen are the most interesting group to me. The freshmen were born in the early 1960s. And they felt no visceral effects from the events that formed the baby boom. To freshmen, the Vietnam War was just something that was inexplicably on TV all the time, like Ed McMahon, you know. I mean, feminism had gone from a pressing social issue to Maud, a, a TV comedy show that their parents liked. And, and, and Martin Luther King was a day off from work. I mean, they, 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 you see, the freshmen take baby boom BS as a given. And speaking economically here, BS has been the greatest, most important economic product of the baby boom. If you don't believe that, just go on the internet. Just go on the internet at random. Punch anything. It's all BS. It's all BS is the motto of the baby boom. And the freshman baby boom were born into BS like fish are born into the ocean. They swim in a sea of BS. They have no idea that there's any other socioeconomic environment, any dry land out there. It's all BS. Now, my particular personal favorite baby boomer is our president, um, born right at the tail end of the baby boom and a perfect specimen of the freshman boomer type. Uh, there was a wonderful example of his being a frosh. Uh, we have to go back to 2008 during Senator Obama's campaign for the White House. Um, you may well remember there was uh, a kerfluffle about the Reverend Jeremiah Wright. Um, Reverend Wright's a man of, how shall we put this, strong views, strongly put, I think. Um, bad word, bad word America, the CIA invented AIDS to kill black people, and so on and so on and so on. And Reverend Wright was the pastor at the Obama's church. He'd married Barack and Michelle. He baptized their children. Well, the Republican Party and outraged conservatives and the right-wing media screaming on talk radio and Fox TV, knew it. they went nuts over this. They were determined to turn Reverend Wright into a major scandal that would end Barack Obama's political career forever. But the scandal didn't happen. The story just sort of petered out. Why? Because of us, the baby boom. We realized perfectly well that while the Reverend Wright was thundering from the pulpit, Senator Obama was paying absolutely no attention at all. <laughs> he was sitting in a back pew on his Blackberry with a Rahm Emanuel, you know. <laughs> Everything Reverend Wright had to say went right past his head, you know. Now, my part of the baby boom, the senior class, we would have been standing on a pew with clenched fists in the air shouting right on and demanding vandalism at the nearby University of Chicago, you know? <laughs> and the junior baby boomers, assuming they were awake in time to go to church and assuming they could find the church, they would have been sitting there nodding in stoned agreement and hoping the church's social outreach program included free lunch, you know? And the sophomore baby boomers, they would have been thinking, gosh, Reverend Wright, I don't, I don't know, that might be pitching it a little high and inside, you know. But President Obama, freshman baby boomer, he didn't even notice, you know, because, you know, it's all BS. You know? And I have a socioeconomic vision, <coughs> excuse me, to present to you. The BS of the American baby boom is the world's future. It's the world's socio-political economic future. It may take decades, it may take centuries, but everyone on the planet will turn into a baby boomer eventually. As soon as their parents get too prosperous and too happy and begin feeling too much affection for their kids and start letting them do anything they want. Unless, of course, um, baby boom style extravagant freedom, scant responsibility, plenty of money and a modicum of peace, 
lead to such a high rate of worldwide carbon emissions that we all fry or drown. Um, I can never remember which it's supposed to be. <laughs> it was global warming there for a while, and then we had a cold winter, so now it's global climate change. But anyway, we may all die. Um, but you can't have everything, and you can have a profusion of opportunity and at the same time a collapse of traditional, moral st uh, 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 traditional social standards. And I, I mean collapse of traditional social standards. I mean that in a good way. Uh, no more selling your toddlers as child brides or cutting off people's hands for shoplifting food for their families. You look at Western Europe and the wealthiest parts of Asia and Latin America, and they're almost as useless as, as we are. Again, I mean useless in the best sense of the word, with, with abundant disposable income and ample leisure time to devote to pointless activities that don't harm anybody else, like fly fishing, you know? And it's interesting to me that baby boom-like places all around the world all seem to be in the same kind of national political deadlock that we are here in America, arguing about government benefits versus government costs. I mean, there's much tutting uh, by pundits about national political deadlock. But it is an improvement on a certain kind of national unity. Germany wasn't in national political deadlock when it marched into Poland in 1939. Japan wasn't in national political deadlock when it bombed Pearl Harbor. Russia wasn't in national political deadlock when it snatched Crimea. Give me deadlock any time, you know? See, I foresee a day when all the world's noxious politics will disappear because all the world's political science classes will happily degenerate into hour-long shouting matches the way my baby boom political science class did in 1968. Uh, we were shouting at each other about the war in Vietnam, but I can't remember why we were shouting at each other about the war in Vietnam, because the students were against the war, the professors were against the war, the custodial staff was against the war, but that didn't keep us from shouting at each other. Why? because we were having fun, just like the Democrats and Republicans are having fun in Washington right now. You know, the baby boom doesn't have noxious politics. Communism, fascism, Islamist, Islam, Islamist fanaticism, baby boom really doesn't have any politics at all. We've had three baby boom presidents so far. Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama. You could map those guys out politically, and you'd have to go to Pyongyang to find somebody who is more different politically uh, uh, than they are from each other. You, know? you see, it's hard to have politics that are truly noxious when you like being obnoxious better. You know? In the baby boom world of the future, we'll also enter an economic golden age. Stupid notions of central planning, nationalization, protectionist trade barriers, high regulatory costs, all that stuff, all will fall to the wayside when everyone is asleep in Econ 101 the way I was. You know, <laughs> you know there are, there are 1.3 billion people in the world living on a dollar and a quarter a day or less, the way I once was selling pot. Um, I <laughs> smoked all the profits. Um, sooner or later, these people are going to figure out there's a better way. In fact, I, I just received an email from Nigeria about a rather large amount of money needing to be <laughs> transferred to uh, American Bank, requiring only modest uh, assistance on my part. Uh, there will be no religious fanaticism in, in, in a baby boom world. We're not a generation who listens to anybody, God included. Now, in our defense, it is my faith and conviction that I doubt God minds us not bothering him. Very few of the people we've bothered, parents, college deans, the police, LBJ, attractive types in bars, have minded when we quit bothering them. I think God will get over it. Um, world peace, probably too much to ask. But it will be hard to assemble those huge conscripted armies that used to fight wars because we'll all have a letter from our doctor about how we're allergic to camouflage, you know? <laughs> Besides, war is about power. An interesting thing about the baby boom is that we're, we aren't power hungry because power comes with that kick of responsibility. We're greedy, greedy for love, happiness, experience, sensation, thrills, praise, fame, adulation, inner peace, and as it turns out, money. Uh, 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 health and fitness, too. But we're not greedy for power. Observe the baby boomers who have climbed to the peak of power in Washington, D.C. Are they the best and brightest? No, the best and brightest are over at Goldman Sachs. You know? 
So I have a message for all the dictators and despots and autocrats and oligarchs who rule the worst countries on earth. You will turn in to baby boomers too. It shall rain on your woodstock. You shall spend your treasure on discos, cocaine, and rehab. Your junk bonds shall default and your dot com and your mortgage lending bubble shall burst. You shall form overage garage bands and try to play Margaritaville. Your third spouse shall acquire an American Express black card with a credit limit higher than the Greek national debt. <laughs> your daughters shall wear nose rings. Your sons shall have pagan symbols indelibly marked upon their necks, unless you belong to one of those cultures where daughters wear nose rings and sons have pagan symbols indelibly marked upon their necks, in which case they shall not. Uh, you shall be perplexed by the internet. You shall grow old and addled enough to vote for Ron Paul in a presidential primary. There, there is no escape from happiness, attention, affection, freedom, irresponsibility, money, peace, opportunity, and thinking it's all BS. Behold the baby boom, ye mighty, and despair. Thank you. Mr. O'Rourke, we now have time for a few questions. Please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. I know there was an awful, an awful moment where you thought I came up here to give that speech again. <laughs> Not going to do it, Uncle. But I am perfectly willing to answer some questions if anybody has any question. Any kind of question, really. I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist. I'm an instant expert on anything, so. <laughs> Hi, thank you for that. Ma'am. Yes, sir, thank you for that great talk. I'm a little confused. Um, I was conceived during the uh, last of the uh, sophomore year, but born the first of the freshman year. So, and both my parents were first generation Americans with their parents all coming from Eastern Europe. So, who is Well, you, you see, what that actually makes you, yeah, what are you? Um, it, it, what that actually makes you in a way is, is more like a senior or, or, or a junior baby boomer because of the culture shock of having parents come in from out of town, you know, and go, this is America? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think that there's a, a lot of, uh, uh, of what defines being a baby boomer is being in the midst of this change. And you, because of your circumstances, were in the midst of more change than most people born in, you know, around the cusp of the sophomore. What else have we got? Anyone else out here? Her face gone. Dr. Arn. Do you think Obama's interested in power? Do you think Obama's interested in power? Yeah. yeah, I do think he's interested. Just because I said baby boomers in general weren't interested in power doesn't mean that specific sorts of them aren't. aren't, aren't. Um, it, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's all. In fact, actually, if you think about it, that's all liberal politics is, really, is, is I mean, my objection to liberalism is not an honest, uh, uh, it's, it's not an honest disagreement. I am willing to have an honest disagreement about how much government should help people who can't help themselves and how large benefits and pensions should be, how much government infrastructure there ought to be, and so on. These are all legitimate uh, um, uh, but, but the real liberal, fundamental liberal position is to expand government power upon any excuse whatsoever. If you throw government power out the door of economics the way we did when the Berlin Wall collapsed, we said, look, this crap just doesn't work. And we pitched, we pitched liberalism out the door of economics. We came right back down the chimney of environmentalism, you know. Now, if you toss it out the window of fresh air, you know, it will crawl in through the crawl space of, like, uh, the rape culture on campus. It doesn't matter what the issue is. The point is to make more, is to give more power to government. You say, well, why? Why would they want to give more power from government? Because every time you give power to government, it takes power away from you. So even if you are fond of power, like President Obama, or for that matter, all elected officials obviously are, but say you're not an elected official, so why would you want to give this, the, 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 this bureaucracy, this government, the, 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 this, you know, 
uh, uh, communitarianism, why do you want to give more power over your life? Because it has a low threshold of entry. Low threshold of entry. People out here who are economists, you probably had to get PhDs, probably even did postdoc work, you know. Those of you who work in business had to get business degrees, you had to know something, you know. Doctors, lawyers, anyone in the professions, even just, you know, uh, the person who runs the most modest little convenience store in the world has a lot, has to know a lot. You don't have to know anything to go into politics. In fact, it seems to help if you don't, you know. They're creating a world out there that spends federal, state, and local budgets, if you combine them, it comes very close to 40% of, of, of American GDP. 40% of American GDP is in the hands of the political process and government spending where, so they, these people have managed to create a world, uh, it's, like the, uh, it, it's like the C students took over the universe, you know, they managed to create a world when they can, of course, nobody gets anything below a C anymore, so you know what I'm talking about here. It's like, you know, the, the noisy kids at the back of the class, you know, who refuse to pay attention and chew gum. Uh, they, they've taken over 40% of our world, you know, and they've got 40% of this world we have no threshold to entry. And so that's, the, to me, is the great danger of liberalism. It's not specific ideas or specific spending programs. Sir, got someone down here. Where is our mic? Oh, there. Uh, when you we'll mentioned you power and baby boomers the first time, you said they avoided power because it came with accountability. Yeah, responsibility. Res well, accountability well, and responsibility. Accountability and responsibility. I think the beauty of the Obama types is they've separated the two. Oh, no yes. Power, no accountability. Yeah. Well, that's a typical BS baby boom way of approaching things. If you do want power, you sure don't want it attached to accountability. <laughs> I mean, gosh, because that would make you accountable. You know, <laughs> I'm not nuts. You know? it's, look, you know, the guy's, he's not a good president, but he's not stupid. <laughs> you know? He doesn't want to be accountable for things. So, yeah, that's, and of course, broadening government helps on that thing, too. You know, bad staff work. It was, uh, I, I don't know how that, you know, that, you know, the government's so big, who knows what's going on over in the Veterans Administration. It's miles from here, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, the, the expanse of government cuts everybody's accountability in government, too. So you see another advantage. Ma'am, back behind you. Hi. Does it strike you as odd that the person who wants so much power over America wants to diminish the power of America? Well, no. It doesn't really uh, 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 surprise me because the uh, um, – America as a power in the world is, as we all know, uh, and I assume there are some veterans in this room who know it all too well, uh, it's a burden. Uh, the kind of being a world power is not the same as having personal power. When you have personal power, you say, go, and they goeth. You say, come, and they cometh, you know. When you are in the international thing, you have to bring tanks to make that happen. You know? so it's like tougher. It's like the real world. Foreign policy is the real world. You know, anybody can say anything they want about foreign policy, but foreign policy is still going to be dependent on a bunch of nutty foreigners. It's not something you can really run. You know, it's not even something you can run poorly, like Obamacare rollout. You know, it's something you can't run at all. It's out of out of your control. And uh, uh, dealing with it means actual use of force, it means putting the lives of Americans on the line. Um, it means hiring a bunch of Republicans, because <laughs> that's what most military officers are. <laughs> Let's face it. And, you know, it's just, just uh, it's outside the realm. What he wants is fame and adulation and the, and the spotlight and that kind of stuff. In fact, I, I actually think we might have here our first celebrity president. I think Clinton had certain aspects of that to him, and doubtless other presidents have too. But uh, I think we have here our first true celebrity. You know, I mean, he wants to, he, his approach to, to world power is sort of the Angelina Jolie approach to world power. Let's think about nice things and do a little charity work, you know. Um, not going to happen. Sir. Congrats for your depth and wit. 
Thank you. You are sometimes identified as a, as a libertarian, and you picked on, on others. But uh, after you heard uh, Larry Arnold speak about faith and family, and is anything you can say about how to libertarians, how con constructive thing, you know, criticism, how the traits of the baby boomers affect libertarians, and how can they be more effective, you know, in their political realm? Well, one of the nice things about the baby boom uh, uh, is that it has, if in practice less than in theory, um, a strong libertarian streak. And I take that largely to be a good thing. My core argument with libertarianism um, actually has to do with the faith thing. See, I, I do not think that libertarians give the kind of weight that they should to faith. Uh, libertarians want everything to be worked out. They want, they're rigidly logical. They want everything to be worked out logically. We all know one of the reasons that we have faith is that we know life is beyond our own personal understanding. And we don't think things just sort of got here by accident and we can arrange them all. You know? I mean, the idea that, 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 that God didn't create the world to me has always been like the, the idea that you would throw um, some eggs and some cheese and some mushrooms and a hot skillet on the floor and get an omelet. You know, I mean, I just, uh, you know, everything about the universe speaks to creation and organization. And, and we understand a lot more about that universe than we ever did before, but we'll never understand all of it. It is beyond the mind of man. And libertarianism has a, a tendency, not universal, uh, but a tendency to regard the affairs of man as being fully comprehensible to man. And I, I spent 20 years as a foreign correspondent, and I've just seen too much inexplicable behavior you know, to believe that man is fully explicable to man. You know, so. Sir. To what degree do you think teaching in the area of responsibility and character trait has been neglected by the baby boomer generation, uh, not only in the home, but in the school system, uh, primary, secondary, university level. And why did that happen? Well, I think that, let's answer the why first. I, I take it as stipulated that it did happen. Um, but, uh, uh, and many of us have spent a lot of our child raising years trying to make sure it didn't happen to our children, either by sending them to private schools or, or to religious schools, uh, many, many of which we can, can barely, if at all, afford. Um, but, the, but the why is because the baby boomers came of age, uh, as millennials are now, in a time of extremely rapid and complex change. Uh, the, the huge growth of the American economy after World War II. Change is hard for people to deal with. It unmoors them a little bit from, from, from their, it's harder to exert authority or submit to authority in a changing world than it is in, a, in an unchanging world. Uh, uh, you know, I always tell my kids, uh, in order to command, you must first learn to obey. But that's really a very Victorian idea. I mean, uh, somebody like Winston Churchill had no problem with the idea of in order to command, you must first learn to obey. But with things changing so quickly, mores as well as economic circumstances, I think it left us a little tough, uh, in a slightly tough position where we were both not willing to, confused about right and wrong, and not willing to, um, uh, uh, even say what we did believe about right and wrong for fear of disproving. And I don't think this was helped by the fact that there was a great wrong in America, <clears throat> great and persistent wrong, of, uh, uh, of racial discrimination uh, and, and religious discrimination, too. Uh, um, uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, showing up for pick up a girl for a date in Boston, having her parents sort of choke on my last name, uh, you know, because I was obviously Catholic. And um, <clears throat> But, you know, tremendous anti-Semitism. But, of course, first and foremost and, and greatest of all was the racism, racial uh, uh, attitudes, not only attitudes, but laws and all, all the rest that went with that. 
Uh, I grew up in, in, in a world, uh, uh, Irish working class, lower middle class world, where words that we would never in the world speak today were common over the dinner table. Just as today, certain words are common over the dinner table that my parents would have rather died than had said out loud. But, uh, 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 but not to give it a moral equivalence. That's one of the things that undercut our own faith in right and wrong. We had been so wrong for so long about that one subject that it shook us a little bit in our faith in other subjects. It didn't help that the mainstream Protestant churches went all gooey on this. It didn't help that we had the Vietnam War, and there certainly were two sides to that argument. Uh, uh, so it was a period of moral uncertainty, so it becomes very hard. And I think that you know, school systems gave in to this moral uncertainty. And you really can't bl blame them. They're public institutions that are answerable to all. So I got all sorts of people picking on them in all uh, different ways. And I think some teachers gave up on it too. And that's really the sad part. Because all of us, especially the older people among us, if we go back to our education, I'll bet each and every one of us there was just one or two teachers that we had from kindergarten through college that really, really made a huge difference for us. And they may not even have been in our subject of focus or expertise. You know, it's, and it's those people that, that we lost a little bit, you know, that were, you know, perhaps afraid to speak out or, and, and, and so, yeah, we certainly created a system that discouraged more of those people. Our questions. Thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. You're very welcome. We will be back in this room in the morning at 8:15 for our first panel session, which is on bitcoins. And if that's a mystery to you, it's a mystery to a lot of us, and we're going to figure it out. So we will see you in the morning. Enjoy your evening.